Hi folks, so quick introduction. My name is Mark McKavanagh and I'm a graduate software engineer at Signified. So some of you might have been able to guess what this presentation is gonna be about based on the subtle hint slash pun in the title. Uh, so yeah, it'll be an introduction to Docker, what it is, how it works and all that good stuff. Uh, just a warning for those of you that do not enjoy puns or memes, uh, I can only apologize. So what is Docker? It's a set of tools to allow you to run your programs in isolation. It has this idea of containers where your code and all of your dependencies are all bundled up inside. Your program is guaranteed to run the same way from one computer to another. Uh, for example, from a developer's laptop to a production server or environment. Uh, you won't get any weird discrepancies between them. So Docker just really delivers the goods uh, in terms of tools for managing a container. Uh, yeah, and it gets rid of this uh, classic line, uh, it works on my machine. So what you need to know is containers are not virtual machines. Virtual machines have their own kernel. The kernel is the core part of the operating system. Um, programs interact with the kernel using something called system calls. It's the interface between the two. For example, if a program wanted to do a network request to get a resource, this would require a system call. Uh, containers will actually use the host machine's kernel. and Due to this, it has less overhead um, in terms of memory. Um, and whatnot, and um, they are far less resource intensive, um, and can spin up. You can spin up a container way faster than a, a VM. So the question then arises: Is how can we get any sort of isolation between containers if everything goes through the host machine? The answer to that question is namespaces. Uh, this is mentioned in the Docker overview docs near the bottom but it's like terms and conditions in a contract. Uh, very few ever venture that far. Uh, so namespaces are a feature of the Linux kernel. Some of you might then be thinking, how, how does that translate? How does that work on Windows or Mac? So under the hood, the Docker engine um, will use a Linux VM um, in that case, that scenario. So, once a container starts, it creates a set of namespaces, which only that container will use. So an example is the PID namespace. Um, all the processes, programs running in one container are separated from another um, and are not visible between each other, uh, but they're still being executed on the host machine and containers cannot see the processes of the host machine either. So from a user issuing a command to a container being created, how does this happen? Um, what, what's the process? So a user will first issue a command in the terminal, for example, docker run. Uh, I will actually do a quick demo of this later on. Um, the docker client is the interface to docker. So then the Docker client will confer with the Docker daemon, Docker D, once uh, it receives that command. So it's a, a service, really uh, a server that runs in the background on a host machine. So once we run that command, a HTTP request is sent to Docker D um, in order to create a container. So once the Docker daemon gets our HTTP request to create a container, it will make a gRPC create container request to container D. Container D is a program, uh, a, a runtime that is started along with Docker D. Uh, I'll also chat a bit later on um, about that acronym gRPC. Um, so container D is basically just an interface to the Linux kernel um, and 
it actually makes the system call to execute run C. So container D uh, also spawns, uh, you'll see in that diagram on the right hand side, um, a few child processes um, called container D shim before actually um, executing uh, the system call um, for run C. Um, I won't go into detail about them, but just be aware of them. Um, so run C here is really what does all the, the heavy lifting when it comes to the creation of the container. It's a binary that when run will spawn a new container and sets up all of the required namespaces for more system calls to get the isolation. The system call that run C will repeatedly make is the unsure system call. Uh, this will create new namespaces and associated with that run C instance, that, that process. Um, another example, apart from the process ID namespace that I mentioned earlier is the network namespace, which can be created by providing this as a parameter to that um, unsure call. Uh, it isolates the system resources uh, to do with networking, um, the IP routing tables, firewall rules, port numbers, all that crack. So there would be no conflicts with the host machine or any other containers. So all of that is a bit over wheel, I mean. <laughs> we'll talk through how a user actually goes about uh, creating a container from, from their perspective. Firstly, they need to create a Docker file. It's a list of steps where order matters on the tiles Docker, what is needed to build an image. So an image is just your template for the container. Once you run the image, it becomes your container. As you can see in that diagram, you have your Docker file, you build that to get your Docker image, and then you run that image to get your container. So uh, I'm going to jump into a quick example just um, of how to spin up a container locally. So I've just jumped over to IntelliJ, my IDE. Um, I have this simple Java program I got online. Um, uh, it just starts up a server, um, binds to port 8080 um, and starts the server. Um, it's a gRPC server. I also mentioned this earlier on. So gRPC is a remote procedure call framework, it provides the tools for communication between a client and a server and uses HTTP2. Uh, it's very commonly used for communication between microservices. So if I just go on down to the implementation of one of our well endpoints, I guess, um, called Echo. Um, it's very basic, so it will accept a request with uh, a string, a message, and send a response just back to that message. That's why it's called echo. Um, and it will also uh, fire back the IP of the machine that sent the request. So if we quickly look at the Docker file, uh, you will see that I first specify here a base image. This is a pre-existing image that has already been built, which we kind of use as a foundation for the new image. In this case here, we have specified a open JDK image, which has a Linux OS and a Java environment, everything you really need um, for running a, a, a Java program. Um, and it's specified using this from keyword. The next thing we're gonna do here is place the dependencies and the, the jar that we have built um, for this program from the clamp machine uh, onto the image using this copy keyword. Uh, another thing we need to do is, because we're running a server here in this Java program, is expose port 8080. Um, because once you run this image, this container will listen on this port so it needs to be uh, uh, accessible. So we use the expose keyword to do this. Lastly, what we're gonna do is spec specify the uh, entry point. 
it's the command we want to run on the container. Uh, in this case, we want to run our Java program. So what we can do now is build the image whilst in the same directory uh, as where this Docker file uh, is located. So this is the command we need to run to do this. So it's, you're basically just commanding Docker to build an image based on the Docker file um, located in this directory. And this tag T option that I've also supplied, uh, you're, you're just tagging this image um, so it can be easily identified. So if we go ahead and run that. So because I already had this open JDK image um, locally, it didn't have to waste any time um, downloading it. Um, it will usually take a, a little bit longer if it does have to go and download um, images and whatnot. Um, you can see after that, it um, very quickly um, executed um, the rest of the commands. So at this point, the image has been built and I can run the command docker images just to prove that. So now we have this built image, what we're going to want to do is run it to get our container. So we will use this command, docker run. And another option I've specified here is tack p. Um, what we're really doing here is you, you have port 8080 of your host machine. Um, any uh, request traffic that come into that port um, will be forwarded on to port 8080 um, of our container, of our, our server, gRPC server running in the, sorry, running. So after I run this command, you'll see we get some output that the server's successfully started. Um, so at this point, it's just let, listening on that port there uh, for any traffic to come in. So what I can do now is actually send a request um, to the server. And um, we're gonna do this using um, the gRPC command line uh, tool. So we're just gonna make a gRPC call um, to localhost 8080, which is gonna hit our container. Um, and we're gonna use the echo endpoint and we're gonna supply it with uh, this message. So we should hopefully just get that fired back at us. And yep, there you go, uh, it sent the request um, and this is the response it got and just the message fired back at us um, along with the IP of our machine. Um, you also see here in the output, um, that it received that request. Okay, so I'm gonna jump back into the presentation just quickly. So what are the benefits of Docker? First one is it can be wired into your continuous integration solution. So when a developer pushes code to Bitbucket, GitHub, whatever you have, uh, a new image will be built and saved to a Docker registry with a version and a tag. So a registry just stores Docker images and you can have a private one for internal company use. And an example of a public one would be your Docker hub. Uh, it's also uh, very, very fast to spin up a new container as you just seen, um, mere couple of seconds. Um, the isolation, we get through namespaces also gives you that guarantee that each container will only use the stuff uh, assigned to them. Again, because of namespaces um, and this isolation, uh, it's really, really good um, from a security perspective, um, having all of your applications in um, separate containers. So I'm also gonna quickly talk about Docker Compose. Uh, it's a set of tools that allows you to spin up multiple containers. Um, so what you really need here um, is a YAML file, which specifies uh, all the services, well, images you would like to run. And you just need to run one command um, once you have that YAML file sorted, um, the Docker Compose up, 
and that should be all you need. Um, so I'm going to do a really quick example. So this is an application I found online um, called CTFD. Uh, it's a Python Flask application, I believe. Um, so it's this application um, is used to host capture the flag challenges. Um, it's really used by the security community um, to create challenges for others to solve um, by finding a hidden answer, uh, a piece of text known as a flag. Um, it allows you to input questions, will accept answers from users, um, assign points to them, and even has this pretty cool leaderboard here to track uh, scores. So if we quickly just look at the Docker Compose YAML file um, for this application, um, you can see there's a pile of config in here. Um, you have your main CTFD um, image that will be built, um, but it's also um, supplying um, other images that are required um, for this main application to successfully work. So here it's instructing um, to pull the Nginx image, which is really used for load balance, I believe, in this application. Um, and also another one here for persistent storage. Um, it's pulling a MySQL image, I believe. And another one here is a Radis cache. You don't really need to be concerned what all these are doing. Um, it's just an example um, of Docker Compose being able to spin up um, multiple images. So what we can just do is when in the, doc, the directory, sorry, um, of this YAML file, all we have to run is docker compose up. Um, and that should be all you really need to do. Um, let it do its work. And there you go. Um, it's right put it there that um, this application is now up and running localhost port 8000. So if I give that a go, you'll see that the, that, that application is now successfully running. Um, this is the setup page for the admin user um, to set up the event that they want to run. Um, yeah, that's all I really wanted to show there. So we'll jump back in. So the last thing I'm going to briefly touch on is Kubernetes, um, as it provided an opportunity to get another pun in, so I had to tag it. Um, so for using Kubernetes, uh, it's what you should really be doing to run your containers in a production environment. It's an orchestration system that uh, provides the ability to scale and monitor the health of your containers. Um, it has a lot more functionality than that also. Um, it provides a command line tool, uh, Cube Control, um, gives you the ability to mess with your containers, um, and also has a, a dashboard there you can see on the right hand side over here, um, where you can have um, control um, and also view metrics such as CPU usage and memory usage. Um, some key terms to be aware of um, with Kubernetes is the pod, uh, it's the name of an instance of a container um, and a service. Um, a service will just have a set of pods. So here's just a list of links where I got uh, where I learned stuff for this presentation from. Um, all good stuff. I would recommend um, giving them a read. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, um, that's all, folks. Uh, there's a few uh, final puns I've just chucked in there, but uh, yeah. Any questions, feel free to fire away, even on LinkedIn. Um, but yeah, thanks for watching and listening. Cheers.